doxology, the new one, is what we're going to sing first. If you know it, sing along. The words should be up there. as we begin this morning. This is Memorial Day weekend. We remember those who, have, who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. John 15 says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. In Psalm 82 says, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. And then I found this poem which says, is it enough to think today of all our brave, then put away the thought until a year has sped? Is this full honor for our dead? Is it enough to sing a song and, and deck a grave and all year long forget the brave who died that we might keep our great land proud and free? Full service needs a greater toil that we who live give heart and soul to keep the land that they died to save and be ourselves in turn the brave. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we know that we don't stand here without something having happened. We live in a, a, in, a, in a nation where religion is free because men and women have died to keep that freedom. Not just religious freedom, but many other freedoms as well. And so, as we remember those who've died uh, over the last many, many years and those who are putting their lives on the line now, we thank you that we can live in a country of freedom. We thank you for the for the men and women who sacrificed for me, for us, for our nation. And may we not just give lip service to it one weekend a year, but Lord, help us to stand firm and stand strong in the sacrifice that has been made and will continue to be made that our country would remain free. We pray this in your name. Amen. And we wonder, what can we do in times like these? The Bible says this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. So let's sing about in times like these.
upon Jesus. To spend some time in prayer this morning, and I, Gail Rao called me Friday, and she asked if we would add her children to our prayer list. Their grandmother passed away suddenly; they weren't expecting it, and so they're kind of deal, having a hard time dealing with it. So, pray for Gail Rao's children. Pray for Gail and the rest of the family in the passing of their grandmother as well. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. Help us not to get in the way of worship. Help us not to get in the way of your blessing and the descent of your spirit. I believe that we work hard to allow your spirit to speak and allow the word of God to speak to us each Sunday. And so I pray that that we don't get in the way of that. In the same way, I pray that we don't get in the way of other people seeing Christ through us, that we follow the way you want us to live and the way you want us to be. Lord, we would ask that in, in the days that we live, that we would represent Christ faithfully, that we would be witnesses for Jesus in the way we talk, in what we watch, in what we read in how we carry ourselves all the time. 
I don't know that we will reach a level of perfection. But Father, I pray that we can live in such a way that our passionate desire is to serve you faithfully and be your servants. Lord, I thank you for those who have sacrificed their lives for our country. I thank you for those who have laid down their lives and even they, those who will continue in the future to do that. We pray that in, in the spiritual fight that we would lay down desires, lay down our own wishes, and serve the God that brings eternal life, eternal freedom, eternal release from bondage. Our Heavenly Father, help us to faithfully represent who you are. We ask that many would come to know Christ through us. We pray in your name. Amen. At this time, we receive the offering, so if the ushers would come, we'll ask God's blessing on your giving. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to give. Continue to use it wisely for your kingdom in your name. Amen. I was working in town one afternoon Attending some business affairs 
I heard a commotion a couple streets over and wondered what's happening there. A young man was running from in that direction and stopped just to catch his breath. I asked him to please tell me what was the hurry. He smiled up at me and he said, I was trying to catch the crippled man. Did he run past this way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, Ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. So my friends, if the troubles and burdens you carry are heavy and dragging you down, you've tried everything you can possibly think of, there's no same Jesus that altered the future of a blind man, the deaf, and the lame, is still reaching out in your hour of trouble, one touch and you're never the same, you'll be trying to catch the crippled man, did he run past this way, he was rushing home to tell him did today and the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call it's hard to believe but if you don't trust me ask the blind man he saw it all ask the blind man he saw it all We are in Acts chapter 15. We are going to look at some aha moments and also some wait what moments. Now, an aha moment is a moment of sudden insight, discovery, or realization. It's a moment when you suddenly comprehend a statement or event. It can be a point in your life when an important insight or decision or choice is made. Ah, that's what I should do. But in the passage, there are also what I've called, wait, what? Moments. And these are moments when, you, when an event or statement catches you by surprise. Maybe something you believed in life is suddenly changed, suddenly revealed as different than what you thought it would be. And you're like, wait, what? So the passage has several aha and wait, what moments? as we go through Acts chapter 16. And so we're going to look at some of those, try to get through those this morning. Our first wait what moment is found in verses 6 through 8 of Acts chapter 16. And it says this, that when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden by the Holy Spirit, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in Asia. After they had come to Myasia, they tried to get into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing through Myasia, they came to Troas. Now, if you, if you look at the... Supposed to be a map up there. If you look at the map, you'll realize that they started probably over here in Antioch, and they took a ship over into here. Then they traveled through this entire area of Myasia. Now, this is a missionary journey. This is a missionary journey. And so they travel through this entire area of Asia and up into this Myasia. Then they try to go over here into Bithynia, and the whole time the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 you cannot speak, you cannot go. This is a missionary journey. This is where Paul sits back and he goes, wait a minute, what? 
This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel. They come all the way up here to Troas, and they wait there. They simply, they simply travel through Asia, and they, they're not allowed to speak the message of the gospel. We read a lot about it being a witness for Christ. In fact, we're required to be a witness for Christ. In the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, it says this, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We are, we are taught incessantly to preach the gospel, to share our faith. In addition to that, this is a missionary journey, as I said. It's expected that the travelers uh, will preach the gospel and in the process also plant churches. Remember, if we go back to when they took off on the journey, their journey was to visit the churches that they had been to on their first journey, and then we also know that they planted new churches as they went as well. They went into some new areas, but it was all for the purpose of preaching the gospel. Well, wait, wait, what? The Holy Spirit said, you are not allowed to preach the gospel in Asia. You are not allowed to go into Bithynia and preach the gospel there. And we're not told why. One of the things that we have to understand when we come to Christ is God is not required to tell us the reasons for his decisions. It seems contradictory to everything we've learned about the gospel and about preaching for the apostle to be told, do not share the gospel, or do not, uh, do not plant churches here in this area. But that's exactly what they're told to do. They simply made their way through Asia. They, they, they didn't stop. They didn't plant churches. They weren't allowed to go into Bithynia. They simply ended up in the, in the port town, the coastal town of Troas. They simply said, the Bible simply says, they're forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, and when they tried to go into Bithynia, the Spirit hindered them, stopped them from going in. Do you believe this next statement? God has a plan. God has a plan. We plan, we plan in the will of God, we plan seeking God and trying to find out exactly what God would have us to do, but as that plan develops and as that plan takes place, we have to be ready for God taking us in a different direction than we initially began. Proverbs chapter 16 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We have this desire. Paul and Silas and his group had a desire to preach the gospel in Asia and then up in Bithynia. But God said, No, I have a different plan. I want you to take different steps. I want you to do something different. Jeremiah 10 says, O Lord, I know the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. God lead us in the way that we should go. This is not saying that we shouldn't plan, but what it's saying is be sure to fit with God's plan. What, is, what, is God, what would God have you to do When the Apostle Paul, when he was still Saul, was confronted on the road to Damascus in the book of Acts chapter 9, he has a confrontation, he falls to his knees, he's blind, and he, and he looks up, or he lifts his head, and he says this, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to what do? You, what do you want me to do? And that really, that, that statement becomes the Apostle Paul's commission, that becomes his mantra, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now here, as he goes to Asia, as he goes, tries to go into Bithynia, that statement is challenged. Paul, are you really willing to do whatever I want you to do? This is contrary to really what you believe, what you think, but you understand that I have a plan, and my plan is right, and my plan is better. We think, I, I, when I, as I was going through this, I was thinking of Mary, the mother of our Lord, and she said to the Lord, be it unto me according to your will. Now that's a blank check. That's a blank check for God. Be it unto me according to your will. Lord, whatever you would desire, whatever you want to happen, and of course you know the, you know the Christmas story, you know the story of the birth of Christ, the advent of Christ. It, it came in, in every possible way contrary to what we think should happen, and yet Mary was willing to follow that path literally to the end, to the death of her son, as she was there at the crucifixion. Lord, be it unto me according to your will. Don't believe for a second 
that Mary wanted to see her son die on a cross, but she had said and she meant, be it unto me according to your will. Can you say that? Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, I have plans and I have desires and I have passions and I have things, but Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out and I'm going to start doing things and I'm going to, you know, some of them will be specifically ministry, some of them will be more friendship or family oriented, but God, I'm willing to change. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, be it unto me according to your will, not according to my desire, not according to my initiative, God, according to your will. What do you want me to do? See, sometimes our wait what moments aren't so much wait what, but rather, what do you mean? I don't get to do what I want? God has a plan. God has a plan. And although we plan, we need to fit into what God is doing. So that's really the first wait, what moments, but then immediately following that, we have our first aha moment. Look at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia. If you put that slide up, that map up again, we'll see where that goes. If she can put that up. So they're stuck here in Troas, and up here in, in Macedonia, in this area is where they were called to go. They first go to this little town of Philippi. So they've traveled from Antioch, they've traveled through Asia, and not been able to preach the gospel. They couldn't go in here, and now we get to Troas, and suddenly we go, oh, Paul goes, I get it now. I know why we couldn't go into Asia, or why we couldn't stop in Asia. I know we couldn't go into Bithynia. God, you had a different plan for us. You had something else for us. And so we have this aha moment. It makes sense now. Had they delayed in Asia, had they gone into Bithynia, they would not have gotten into the area of Macedonia, the place that God wanted them to be, the place that God needed them to be. You can take that slide down now. The plan of God was to preach to the cities of Philippi and then to Thessalonica and then to Berea, and ultimately they're going to get into Athens. And, and, and when they get into Athens, it's a, a, a tremendous story of how God works there in a city of a lot of philosophies. But had they stopped in Asia, had they been held up there, had they gone a different direction, they never would have gotten where God wanted them to be. So Paul is finally going, oh, I get it. I get it. Now I know why you didn't want us to stay here. You have a greater work or a great work for us up here. The course they originally tried was going to take them away from God's plan. Thankfully, they listened. God has a reason for everything he does. God has a reason for everything that he leads us into in our life. Now, maybe, maybe I'll use the word unfortunately. I'm not sure that's the right word. But unlike in, in, in this journey in Acts 16, God doesn't always tell us the whys. But why did that happen? Well, it happened because it was my will. Well, or why couldn't? Well, because, see, God doesn't always give us the reasons. Now, here in, in Acts 16, they realize, oh, yeah, you want us to go into Bithynia, or you, you want us to go into Macedonia. You want us to get to Philippi, work our way down into Greece, into Athens. And so they know, but God doesn't always tell us that. But by faith, we follow. And by faith, we believe. By faith, we believe that God is more than just good. We believe that God is always right. And when we come to those realizations, and, and, and I'm not saying it's easy because there are things that happen that we don't like and that, that are, we struggle with. But God has a plan, and his plan is always right. So as we go through the passage, verses 11 to 15, de detail the meeting uh, that they have with Lydia and the worshipers that are there in Philippi. They go to the river, which again is an indication that there was no synagogue in Philippi. There, there were Jews there, but there weren't enough Jewish men to start a synagogue. So traditionally, the believers would meet by the river. And so Paul and Silas and his group find where they're meeting by the river, and they meet with Lydia, or they meet Lydia, and they meet the rest are there. And then they preach the gospel to them. And this group of people, Lydia being the leader, 
become, they all become believers in Christ, they get baptized, and then they begin a ministry in Philippi out of the home of Lydia, who was a businesswoman, a dealer in purple dyes. And so, kind of again, kind of a unique situation in that neck of the woods during the first century. So that's just, that's kind of a basic outline we get there. There's really not a whole lot of aha or wait what there, other than the fact that Lydia was a businesswoman, was, was, which was unusual for her for that area. But we're not going to go there because we find our next wait what moment in verses 16 and following. So Luke records that as they taught and as they ministered to the city of Philippi, there was a demon-possessed girl who followed behind them constantly, day after day. And this is what she was shouting. These men are the servants of the Most High God who, pre- who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did that constantly, day after day after day after day. And Paul loses it, okay? Look at verse 18. And, she did, and, and this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed... Greatly annoyed. Now, when they say greatly annoyed, the Greek word means to bring to exhaustion. It, it's actually exhaustion that leads to piercing fatigue. She just drove Paul nuts, constantly yelling this out. <clears throat> Paul, greatly annoyed. Paul, keep continue on in the, in the verse. Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, not to the girl, said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. He came out that very hour, which means he came out instantly. Paul became annoyed, so annoyed that he cast the demon, the spirit, out of this woman to get her to stop declaring the message. And this is where we stop and go, wait, wait, what? Isn't any publicity good publicity? Remember, she's speaking the truth. She's declaring the truth. These are messengers from God. They are giving the way of salvation. So why didn't Paul simply allow her to continue to declare that? It would actually draw in crowds so that they could listen or they would listen. Now, we may think that any publicity is good publicity, but there's things we need to consider in the account. First of all, let's think about the girl. Okay, I want you to think about the girl and the position that she was in. She was being controlled by an evil spirit and exploited for the benefit of her owners. And I don't want you to downplay the word owners. Before we mistakenly think that this was beneficial to the girl, remember that the word used here, she is described in the text as a slave girl. Don't think for a minute that they treated her nicely. This is a slave. She's a money maker. She's a thing to them. She's a possession. She's not a person. So don't think for a second that they were treating her well. The word that Luke uses to describe her owners is the word kurios, which is the word that is used for Lord, master. This was not a good situation. It was a slave owner relationship. And I guarantee you they didn't treat her well. The passage doesn't delve into it, but they only used her for what they could get. Now, in addition to that, she is uh, possessed by a demon. Demons are wicked, unkind, barbaric things that more than likely tormented this girl. Again, just like her owners didn't treat her well, this demon would not have treated her well. Demons are liars. Demons are horrible. Demons, demons are out simply to hurt and to harm And though they may look good for a while, it's all for the purpose of destroying later on. The passage does not go into that. But demons, the paranormal spirits, are nothing to play around with. They will destroy you. As I said a few weeks ago, do not watch, read, or get involved in the paranormal. It will slowly destroy your spiritual life. This this girl was probably tormented day and night by this demon, purely for their entertainers. And then another concern is the witness that she was handing out. Even though she she spoke truth, evil spirits are not the kind of testimony that you want. Demons are not the kind of thing that you want 
declaring your righteousness or your goodness. Demons are liars. Satan is referred to as the father of lies. And even Jesus silenced the demons when they spoke. Mark chapter, Mark's gospel says this, Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet! Come out! So even Jesus declared that uh, silence the demons when they testified, even though they might have been speaking truth. And so our, wait, what? Moment turns into, a, ah, I get it, aha, I get it. Uh, Paul needed to silence the evil spirit and free that girl from the spiritual bondage that she was in, and physical bondage as well. <clears throat> now, as we move on, the reaction of the slave owners and what happened to Paul and Silas are recorded in the rest of the chapter. So our next wait, what moment is found actually in, you've got to put two sections together. So look at verses 22 and 23, but then also we're going to jump over to 36 to 38 and read those as well. So 22 and 23 first. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded they be beaten with rods, and when they had landed many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commending the, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So Paul and Silas are beaten and then thrown into prison. And then if you look at 38, 36 to 38, we read, So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. And Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? <laughs> no, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Now, when you, put, when you read verses 22 and 23, we cringe at the punishment that they received, the beating, probably with rods, receiving many stripes. And then we read verse 37 and realize that because they were Roman citizens, they, didn't, they actually didn't have to be beaten. They could have avoided that beating because you cannot beat a Roman citizen without a trial. And they had no trial. So it's like, wait, wait, what, Paul? What are, what are you doing? And if you look in the, if you look through, as we go through the book of Acts, there are places where Paul, at one point, he's stretched out to be beaten. He, he turns to the guy with a whip and he goes, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And the guy freaks. He says, you cannot beat a Roman citizen. So when they come to him, or when these magistrates, back to 16, when the magistrates come, they're terrified because if that news got back to Rome, got back to Caesar, they could lose their commission and possibly suffer punishment as well. So they're getting a little nervous, but we stop and go, wait, wait, Paul, why, why, why did you do that? Why did you, why did you let that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Why didn't they declare their Roman citizenship far sooner? I, I think there are a couple possibilities. First of all, <clears throat> maybe they did try. Maybe in the chaos of the arrest and, and what was happening, maybe they did try to declare their citizenship but they could not be heard, or maybe they were ignored. The lies and the chaos of the arrest, the accusation, the slave girl, the punishment, all that was going on, the money that was being lost by the, by the owners of the slave girl, maybe that all prevented from Paul and Silas of having an opportunity to declare their citizenship. That's a possibility. Another possibility is Paul realized that this injustice would actually give the church in Philippi a little bit of leverage. The magistrates would have been a little less anxious in attacking the Christians for fear that what they had done, the mistake that they had made, might get to Caesar. That sounds a lot like blackmail, but it's possible that Paul, in, in, in that moment and in, in the spirit, is thinking, you know, this might actually in the long run help the church. Another possibility is that the Holy Spirit may have hindered them from declaring their citizenship. Just as the Spirit forbid them to preach in Asia and stopped them from going into Bithynia, 
we, he may have prevented them from speaking up for their own protection. Remember, because they ended up in the prison, the jailer and his entire household came to know Christ and followed Christ. It transformed an entire household. You look at, you look at what came out of that. Now, the reality is we don't know. We don't know why Paul at times declared, or a couple times declared his Roman citizenship and avoided a beating, and other times he simply remained silent. I don't believe it was an oversight on Paul's part. I think that Paul knew he could have avoided that. But what we do know is that the church in Philippi became a key church in the area. What we do know is that many, many became followers of Christ because of their visit to Philippi. We do know that their faith grew and grew and became strong. Many were challenged. Many came to know Christ. And seemingly because Paul and Silas were faithful to God in the city and in the prison and in that situation. Maybe what God is taking us through is harmful to us, but great for the kingdom of God. Maybe, maybe we need to stop focusing on what's good for me or the church or my church or this church and say, God, what is good for the kingdom of God? The church at Philippi continued to grow, continued to minister, continued to, to, to move out, and it all began with an incredible injustice. What's good for the kingdom of God is more important than what is good for me or you. The Apostle Paul understood that. And again, we don't know for sure. Now, we may have a lot of, wait, what, moments as we serve God. We may not always understand why events happen or what the outcomes may be or why God leads us in some ways. In fact, some of our, wait, what, moments may never become, aha, moments. We may never, we never be, able, be, able, be able to finish that. Some actions of God don't make sense while we're still here in this earth. <clears throat> but we read through the book of Acts, we see God working. We see God working in ways that are amazing. We see people coming to Christ. We see, we see the church. We see the gospel taking root and becoming foundational. Remember, the, the events of the book of Acts are still happening today. There was, there was a foundation laid in this book for preaching the gospel that continues on to today. Reading the book of Acts reminds us that it's a prequel for our work, our work in actions today, is it not? This is, this is the beginning of what we're still doing today. When you look at the book of Acts, when you finish the book of Acts, we come to the end of the, end of the book, Acts chapter 28, verse 31, and it says this, that, the, uh, that Paul was still preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. When does, the, when does the book of Acts end? At the coming of Christ. You're right, it doesn't. We, we are Acts chapter 29. We are Acts chapter 29. It, it doesn't end, it continues on. And, and we need to realize that <clears throat> we are the ones who now are preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. And we look at, we look at the book of Acts, we see that all these, these wait what moments, these aha moments, they're going on today. Lord, why did you do that? Oh, I get it. I see why you did it. Well, Lord, why did you do that? Oh, I get it. Now I understand. Now we don't always get the understanding, but this we do know is that God is using us to reach, the, to, to, to reach people with the gospel of Christ. And as you read in the newsletter coming up next Sunday, with all, with all the horrible events that are happening, the shooting in Texas, the shooting in, in Buffalo. I actually looked, at, looked up a website. There's a website that chronicles all of these. And in the month of May, just this month, 40 people have been killed and like 257 injured in shootings. Now, some of them are in a home or they're not all in public places. But, but we look at that. I look at that and I cringe. 40 people in one month. And I didn't even expand the search to, other, to the year I was afraid to. If you look at the list, it's a spreadsheet, and ev almost every single day there's something, a, there's a shooting that has taken place in the country. 
How does the church respond to that? The church responds by continuing the course, staying the course. What is the answer to the unrest in society today? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's being rejected, but just because it's being rejected doesn't mean we stop preaching it, stop teaching it, stop declaring it. No, in fact, we do it louder because it is the answer. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. Yeah, he went through trouble. He took beatings, and he was redirected, and, he, and, and, and just a lot of stuff happened to him. But what did he do? He stayed faithful to his ministry, faithful to his call. He continued to preach the gospel, as it says, that he preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, knowing that that's what would make a difference in society. Don't stop. Don't stop. You, you won't be accepted by everybody. But Jesus Christ is the answer to the unrest in society today. And some will hear and some will not hear. But we stay the course and we continue to minister the gospel and teach others what Jesus Christ can do in their life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> the opportunity to minister the gospel of Christ. And yeah, there's a lot of, wait, what, Lord? You said what? Or there may be moments of, oh, Lord, I get it. Aha, I get it. But through that all, keep us faithful. Don't let us quit. Don't let us get up. We pray in your name. Amen. Stand and sing, Thou Art Worthy. this morning mistakes and run-ins and everything we believe in you we believe that the word of god is the answer to all of our struggles all of society's struggles so keep us faithful to this book the word of god and keep us teaching and declaring and sharing and living that others might know in your name we pray amen